This is AV Week, your weekly wrap-up of audiovisual news and information. My name is Tim Albright. I'm your host. That gentleman right there is Justin Kennington from uh, Crestron. How are you, sir? Wonderful. Thank you. Good to be here. Absolutely. Uh, also with us is Jason Griffin. Jason is uh, not only from Be At Home, but also from a handful of podcasts that we'll talk about uh, and his partners on the other line. So how are you, sir? I'm doing great, Tim. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Last but not least, brand spanking new daddy again, uh, Big Nate, Nate Snyder, uh, also from uh, a couple of different podcasts, and uh, from Image Stream Medical. How are you, sir? I am doing well. Got a couple hours of sleep last night, so I uh, can't complain. No, no, not with a newborn in the house. You can't, you can't complain. No. Uh, all right. I, be honest with you, guys. Here's, <laughs> I, uh, I made a joke off the air that, that I have been traveling like nobody's business. I really have no idea what time zone I'm in, let alone what state I'm in right now. So <laughs> this should be an interesting show. Um, let's kick it off. Let's see if I can I can remember how to do this in studio because uh, we've been bouncing around and from Cedia and well, last week we were at the, the AV Executive Conference. Uh, let's kick it off with that. Uh, the, the, actually, Infocom. Um, from our friends over at Higher Ed Tech Decisions, Infocom cancels the first of its two Infocom Connection Series events. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was kind of a, a, a shock, but not a shock. Uh, it wasn't really anything to do with, with them, from what I understand what, what the story says. Uh, had more to do with, with the facility's ability to give them space, which is, I don't know, if you've never been to a Crestron event or, a, or with a, to an Infocom event, there's a lot of training, and so therefore a lot of room, so that's an issue. Uh, Nate, your, you were the, your first Infocom experience was this year, so we'll kick it off with you. Uh, how big of a deal is it that this, this first one kind of got kiboshed um, and, you know, isn't going to happen, although the one on the West Coast is going to happen. How, how big of a deal is this? Um, well, I mean, I've noticed, uh, it, it, as you mentioned, it was my first time actually getting out to, to Infocom uh, 2014 in Vegas, um, but uh, the, from talking with people and just observations, the, the trend seems to be there's more and more uh, end users, if you will, quote, end users, uh, mm-hmm. or, you know, um, uh, managers, uh, tech directors, you know, people coming, make decision makers that are coming from universities and higher ed are coming out there. So it seems like that's what this event was uh, was really geared geared towards people like that. Um, and from reading it, it's, it's kind of like I need someone to help me decode this. Maybe somebody with some inside baseball from from Infocom. But I mean, it says space constraints, and I'm not really sure how to interpret that. Does that mean not enough people signed up, and they had space? They you know they they couldn't afford the space, or does that mean that they had, uh, as you as you suggested, um, not not enough space at the venue groups. to accommodate all the people? I'm not, I'm not quite sure what yeah. that means, but, um, yeah. All right. uh, Mr. Griffin, uh, from your standpoint, what do you think this, I mean, the, the second one, actually, the well, now the first one, uh, is going to be more in your neck of the woods, not exactly, you know, right next door, but you know, you could drive to it if you wanted to. Um, is it a huge deal that that this first one got kind of got canceled? And, and you know, they mentioned space restraints, and, and as I mentioned before, that my understanding is that the fact that you know some of their you know meeting rooms weren't exactly being made available. Yeah, you know, being in the residential side, more of a Cedia guy myself. I don't spend a lot of time kind of following Infocom. I've I've never actually been to that show. Uh, The concept of the show I found interesting, though, uh, in that it was targeting end users, and I think that that sort of made it a, to my mind at least, kind of a unique offering. Um, I think in our industry, with everything being so technical, uh, that can often be like a hard line to straddle as far as, um, you know... What line is that, end user? Uh, If if you're, let's say, producing a show or, you know, I hate to use the C word, but producing content online, you know, podcast, blog, whatever it is, um, I've found in my experience that trying to tailor these sort of things to where they're, uh, um, you know, interesting and relevant to both integrators as well as end users can be can be a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, my hats off to Infocom for for trying to do that because, as I understand this event, that was kind of uh, the goal of it. Uh, as far as this being canceled, I kind of had the same thought as Nate. Like I wasn't totally sure how to read that story. Um, they say there was space constraints. Um, I used to work in, in AV as far as setting up for events. That was way back when I first started in the industry. I know that kind of thing can come up. 
Uh, so I wouldn't be totally surprised. I'm sure it's a big deal for the people. You know, there's probably a lot of people who put in a lot of time planning that event. Um, so I'm sure they were reluctant to cancel it altogether. I know initially it went down to like a one-day thing, and then they said, yeah. oh, we don't think one day is enough to really cover what we need to, so they canceled it altogether. Um, you know, they got a second shot at it out here on the West Coast, and hopefully that goes through for them. But, yeah, I'm sure uh, for a lot of people this was a big deal and probably a bummer. Yeah, one of the things that's interesting about the, the show, uh, the, the Infocom show itself, the last couple of years, the influx of, as, as Jason mentioned, end users, or what we can refer to as end users, and you can qualify those any, any way you want. Some people just say, you know, technology managers in, in general, the percentage of, of attendees has, has gone up, uh, I believe, every year for the last three years. Um, in 2013, it was 40%, and I believe it was, it was right around 40 41% this year. So these regional shows were kind of neat, and actually we had a number of people that were actually going to go, go to the, the one in, in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, one group um, that actually did spend some time uh, setting up for this and getting ready for this uh, is a group that's not exactly a, 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 a newbie when it comes to shows, and that's Crestron. And, and Justin, I'm not asking you for the company line, but just from your perspective, um, you know, you've been to, I know, at least the last two major shows, because you and I were there together. Um, yeah. Well, not together, but you were there and, and I was there. Uh, don't, <laughs> don't start with that. Um, is this I mean, we shared the room, but it yeah, wasn't, we didn't. You know, which is what I thought was like. Nice. <laughs> oh, why did I invite you? No, that's right. Um, <laughs> is this a huge? Is, is this is this a big deal, or is it kind of a you know a new show kind of getting off the ground and they're hitting some bumps here? No, that's exact. That's exactly. What I was going to say, actually, just to comment on how difficult it is to get one of these new shows off the ground. You know, you have to get enough participation from the manufacturer side. You have to get enough participation from the training side. And then you have to get enough participation from the attendees who want to see the manufacturers and learn stuff at training. So you have to get sort of three critical masses together. And I think that can be the big challenge. Um, as you mentioned, yeah, we were planning to go. Uh, you said, you know, you and I bumped into each other at the last two big shows at Cedia and Infocom, uh, but, you know, I only get to go to the very big ones. Our trade show team does something like 250 events a year, um, including, you know, the Infocom scale stuff, uh, the Infocom local stuff like this, and then even much smaller shows, you know, where, where even Crestron just has a, a table and a few, uh, you know, brochures and things. Um, so we were ready to go, but uh, I think what happened is they probably just failed to get enough you know, momentum uh, to make this a success. So hopefully they'll pull that together in San Jose. Uh, maybe maybe Infocom itself being on the East Coast next year will build a little more interest momentum uh, on this side of the country, and maybe they can try again next year and get a, a Philadelphia show or a Washington show or something in that area going again. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So well, that, this is an interesting thing here, though. The, the San Jose uh, event that they're planning is going to be happening in March, and this, the one that they just canceled is uh, October, so, you know, maybe they're just putting out some trial balloons for times of the year when people of this specific demographic can actually make it out to a show. Maybe maybe October's not a good time, you know? Well, yeah, yeah you, you think about the demo, and we, we talked about it right, briefly. You're talking about technology managers, right? And, and I, I know a thing or two about them, because I used to be one. Um, October is not the greatest time in the world, <laughs> just to be frank. Um, you're just getting into the swing of fall. The odd thing about March is a lot of times you've got spring breaks somewhere around in there, um, and some folks do a lot of maintenance, a lot of preventive maintenance and, and upgrades during spring breaks. Some of them don't, though, so uh, it'll be interesting. Plus, it's San Jose in, in March. That's not a bad thing. Hmm. Um, all right, uh, moving on. The Internet of Things. The IEEE, which if you don't know who that is, um, look them up. Uh, you need to if you're in the AV industry. Uh, they are embarking on a quote-unquote ambitious effort to build an overarching architecture, say that five times fast, for the Internet of Things spanning a multitude of industries and technologies. Bum, bum, bum. Okay. Uh, Jason, we are going to start with you on this because this is right down your, your wheelhouse, right? This is right down Residential Central. Uh, one of the gentlemen we talked to at Cedia a couple weeks ago uh, was the guys over at Chewy uh, who are living and breathing this whole Internet of Things. Uh, and if you don't know what Chewy is, Chewy is actually a really cool little, uh, they call it a doorbell, but it's more than that, right? It's, it's a box. You push the button, and if, if it recognizes your face, it does all sorts of things. And if 
you know, like if, if Justin comes over, it'll start playing the Shaft theme for him. So, um, <laughs> how much is this? And yeah. do you guys install? It's like a hundred, hundred bucks, two hundred bucks. I mean, seriously. Fun. It, uh, you know, probably Amazon, but no, on their website, Get Chewy. You can get Chewy dot com. The fact I remember that website is amazing to me at this point. Uh, <laughs> two, it was two weeks Wait, ago. What time is it? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> what what time is it? Um, uh, it is 1817 UTC. How about that? Stick the grin. <laughs> that, that, you know what? I should at this point. I should get just. Uh, I have a watch that does it for me. I'm not. I'm okay. not that guy. All right. Um, so yeah, you, you know, th this is right down your wheelhouse. It, does this? Does the? First of all, does the Internet of Things need this? And secondly, is the IEEE the organization to do this? Yeah, it's a great question, Tim. Um, you know, I do a, a, a podcast in addition to the AV Shop Talk one that I do with Nate. Uh, I work on a second podcast called HomeTech.fm yep. uh, where we talk about this stuff all the time. Uh, Chewy was actually a guest on our show a while back, a really interesting product. Um, it, it's funny because on that podcast, we literally like went out and bought a little bell that we ring every time somebody <laughs> announces a new standard or new protocol. Um, it, it's really becoming like the the trend right now is that um, you've got all of these competing standards and, and communication protocols and the uh, proposed solution by most people is to come up with another protocol. So it's it's like yes, we're, standard. You know, we're kind of caught in this catch-22. Um, you know, the IEEE, I saw this is called, they're calling it uh, like the P2413 work group. And my first thought was like, these guys need to hire a marketing department. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, usually, you know, you see there's like a um, couple that come to mind. There's the new Thread Alliance. Um, all Scene has the All Join initiative. Um, kind of catchy names, right? Things that stick in your head. Uh, but everybody's trying to get traction here. I think IEEE is is a good uh, organization to be involved in this effort, just because of the muscle that they have behind them. Yeah. Um, it'll be. I'll be curious to see, you know, what differentiates this from um, some of these other protocols that I named that are trying to, as I understand it, accomplish the same thing. I mean, these guys are all trying to solve the same problem at the end of the day. Um, I think it's an interesting initiative. I'll definitely be keeping an eye on it. And, uh, you know, we'll see where it goes. It, I, I think eventually the Internet of Things, um, as cliche of a term as that is, uh, it's, it's obviously the future. I'm not going out on a limb by saying that. Uh, and there is problems right now with just too many competing standards and protocols. And so... I think anything that can be done to sort of alleviate that is a good thing, um, and we'll see if IEEE can pull it off. Okay, uh, Justin, uh, we, I'm not going to. I was going to go with Ping on this with with Crash John, but I'm not going to go there. You, you guys also uh, at the CDA show announced, uh, or you and Nest, what was it, the initiative? Uh, works with Nest, right? Yeah. Uh, and Crash John works with Nest, so you guys are kind of in that in that vein and in that whole Internet of Things thing. <laughs> that does sound redundant. <laughs> um, but is this, you know, the, the, is the IEEE kind of the right the right group for this? Or because uh, you know Jason mentioned all these other standards, or is it more viable and, and more valuable to the to the marketplace to let everybody and their brother try to kind of hash it out, and then the the you know, the most popular standard, you know, the financially would win. I think what we'll see is a little bit of both. I mean, like you mentioned, we've been we've been in the net of things thing for a little while, really. You know, the 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 type of things that Crestron builds are connected devices that talk to one another. You know, uh, historically, you know, 15 years ago when we started this, it's always through some centralized control hub that sort of serves as the the, the clearinghouse for all the different protocols uh, that might need to exist. Um, so as the you know the the popular world starts to catch on to this kind of technology, I think in the short term we'll see exactly what you just described: different protocols, different standards, sort of just fighting it out in the market for uh, based not really on the protocols themselves, but on how good the products are that end up built on those protocols. I think the IEEE play here is probably is probably the long game, where sure. what really happens with these sorts of technologies is you get this disruption as something new comes along. Things fight it out in the market, but then over time it becomes commoditized. And and when the IEEE gets involved, that's what we're talking about: is big commodity technology. Now, IEEE technologies are things like Ethernet, um, you know, found truly foundational pieces of of everything we do in the world today. Uh, and if you look even at the end of this article, they talk about how uh, if I scroll down a bit, 
uh, you know, that they're going to com uh, coordinate with these other organizations like the uh, ISO and uh, what do they say? General Electric, Oracle, Qualcomm, Zigbee, other guys that are working on protocols that are out there to compete. The IEEE is really, in, in, in my estimation, they'll sort of lay back. They'll see who's got the best winning protocol, what makes sense from the technology side and from the who's winning in the market side, and then try and push the broader industry, you know, over five, over ten year horizons towards a more standard approach for everything. And then one day, ten years from now, you know, guys like me will go buy an Internet of Things chip and it'll be based on IEEE 2611.6 or whatever, or maybe 2413 if I had to hazard a guess. <laughs> nice, very nice. Uh, <laughs> Nate, when it comes to your world, uh, you, you deal a lot in obviously the medical uh, in medical field when it comes to AV. Not really something that you guys are dealing with yet, but from your perspective and from your expertise, where do you see this going with IEEE? Uh, I mean, my big takeaway from this uh, article on Computer World here is uh, this is a, this seems like a huge undertaking to try to get all of these different devices talking nicely to one another under the same umbrella. Um, in the medical world, everything is proprietary. Not everything, but, you know, there, it's kind of, there's a, there's a sense that there's like a cutthroat uh, industry. Well, there's a, there's a sense of being cutthroat, I guess I should say, where, you know, different, different uh, scope manufacturers will, you know, put out, you know, a scope that puts out a funky video signal format, and you've got to figure out how to deal with that. And you can't go to the website and download <laughs> you know exactly what they're doing because they don't really want you to know what they're yeah. doing because they're not really making things for integrators. So, I, I mean, the 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 article did touch on uh, medical equipment, which really kind of piqued my interest. So, I think my big takeaway is that this is a, this is going to be a huge undertaking, and uh, I think it's going to be a while before I think the 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 example they gave was something about you know measurements taken for blood oxygen sensors in a patient's finger, and then that's affecting you know blood pressure monitor that squeezes the arm. And um, I think we're a long way from that, uh, from my perspective. And then B, the other thing is, um, when, once you put these things into play and you have all these interactions going on automatically in the background, and you've got people that need to understand. Now, you know, it's not just like, okay, I'm gonna do this test, and this machine is gonna do this one thing. There could be a number of variables that that machine does that now you have to be aware of. And it, I don't know. It's to me, there's in the medical world, there's a. It kind of scares me a little bit, to be honest. <laughs> you know, just trying to get everything to communicate properly. But uh, I think it is where we're headed in the long run. You know, I think I do agree with with you guys on that. But uh, I think it's uh, a big undertaking. Well, and then you get into the whole, you know, <laughs> Big Brother conspiracy theory, where you know, if your blood pressure goes too high, well, then they spike your 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 uh, <laughs> your, your insurance rates. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I say that after I just got my in, my life insurance policy the other day, and I got a nice present for being forty, just for the record. So, y'all three of you have something to look forward to. Well, shouldn't gym memberships yes. just be free then? In that well, case, yeah. <laughs> you know, like shouldn't they just be handing these things out? Well, I saw paying for life insurance. Yes, I. Agree. Yes, the it like tripled. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? I mean, it's not wow. that. Still, yeah, it tripled. It's like, holy <laughs> crap! Seriously. Man. Don't turn 40, kids. Just don't, don't, don't. All right. Good, good advice. Yeah, <laughs> you just keep going. Um, we're going to get into the world of 4K. Thank you, Epson. Uh, Epson uh, showed off a, a nice little 4K uh, projector from our friends over at twice.com, uh, showing an, a three LCD-based projector using doing 4K. Uh, first, two things that came out of this, right? And we're going to start with Justin here because he's our, our resident 4K expert being uh, being uh, all things DM for Crestron. Uh, two things with this. First of all, is there a technology that anybody in this is actually kind of for all of you, but Justin, we'll start with you, that can't do 4K, right? Um, you know, is, you know, I don't know if, if, you know, if CRTs could, you know, if, if they were still around, if they could re reproduce 4K. In other words, where my brain went with this is, holy crap, you know, three LCDs can do 4K, most likely, obviously, DLPs can as well, um, you know, Obviously, OLEDs and stuff like that, but are, are we reaching? Are any of these technologies simply going to go by the wayside simply because we're doing 4K? Uh, and the other thing is, you know, are we are we moving too fast into 4K? I guess the is the other part of that question. So, Justin, first thing, is there a technology that that can't do this yet? Or, or yeah. 
I don't think there's any fundamental limit. I mean, there's LCDs, DLPs, Sony, Sony's LCOS, and then, you know, the flat panels. I don't think there's any technology that's fundamentally limited. Uh, what we're missing right now are, the, like, the single-chip solutions for DLPs and mm. LCD projectors, uh, but that's just a matter of, of cost. So the technology can do it. You know, will it be six months or 24 months from now that a single chip can do it? Yes. Uh, and then the cost of those solutions will start to go down. And I think, to me, it's fundamentally that economic argument that's why 4K is going to take off. The fact is, most of these technologies are driven by how many transistors can you print in a little small area, whether it's on a DLP chip or an LCD chip or on a big piece of glass for your flat panel. Um, and I think that the, the economics of that are, I mean, it's Moore's Law. It's how many transistors can you print. So over time, printing more and more transistors becomes free. And now if you're Epson, Samsung, Sony, LG, any of those guys, and if you're their marketing lead and your technology guy comes to you and says, hey, I've got this new technology that gives you four times the pixels and, and it'll be free in three years, do you want it? Well, then he's going to say, yeah, yeah, I can sell that at Best Buy. My new TV's got four times the resolution of that one over there. So I, I don't think there's any technology that we use today. I'm struggling to think of one anyway that couldn't do it. I mean, you mentioned CRTs. I think some of the some of the last gasp, really high end nine inch like Runco stuff could actually do these speeds yeah. ten years ago if you really needed that. Um, though I think you would probably struggle to find one new at the store today. Um, so no, I don't think we're going to lose any technologies as a result of this. Um, I think you know. I, if plasma is not completely dead at this moment, which it might already be, then then I think the new development required to get it to 4K would be the final. You know, we're done yeah. here. Uh, but all the major technologies, the LCD flat panels, and all the basic projector engines uh, are capable of it, including some of the new laser stuff, which is really uh, so far more about uh, optics and light sources than pixels anyway. Um, yes. They still have DLP engines in them and things. Uh, so, no, I don't think we're going to lose any technologies. I think what Epson's doing here is awfully interesting. I'm always fascinated when people get into crazy optics. Uh, I'll tell you a deep, dark secret as long as you promise not to broadcast it. I only got a, a C in optical physics. And, uh, so anytime, anytime somebody does stuff like this where they're, like, wiggling the optics to, to make pixels that weren't there, like, I kind of get what they're doing, but it always impresses me when they pull off stuff like that. The, the fact that you took optical physics impresses me. So, <laughs> well, it was it was at nine a.m. and the professor was really boring, so I didn't go a lot. I'll, I'll admit that. Again, you you took optical physics. <laughs> Not even see, I, I I I didn't even take physics, let alone a special derivative of physics. So, well. I'm a communications guy, and I I wire things and you know. Uh, so is it really is it really 4K though? I mean, if if you have to rely on uh, this pixel shifting technology, um, I, I don't know. My my big beef with this 4K business right now is that it's great for marketing departments and it's not so good for engineers and designers. Um, it, it's you know, can I really get uncompressed 4K today delivered? You know, from from source to sink. It's 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 some sort of compressed, watered down version, pixel shifted. 420 color space, yada yada yada. It's not like it's not true 4K. That's that I see being brought to market. There are some solutions like out there. <laughs> what? You mean like the red player or something? I mean, is that what you're talking about? Or yeah, I mean, I I just well, well even I don't know if what, I can why chime in so, here. Why? Yeah. What? What's that, Jason? I, I was gonna say uh, to Nate's point, and and I just I wanted actually to ask you guys about this for a little clarification because I I was scratching my head a little bit. Uh, I found a CNET article on this projector, which is the LS10,000. Uh, okay. It says, accepts the 4K input, uh, but is instead a 1080p3 LCD, which uses pixel, pixel shift technology to simulate 4K. So what does that mean exactly? Okay. Like, that wasn't very clear to me. Do you, I, I don't know, maybe you guys can chime in on that, but I, I was very, uh, scratching my head about that now, one. I never I'm took optical physics. I can't explain it. I don't know. <laughs> it's not 100% clear to me, but my guess is that kind of what's going on is they are essentially, they're, use, it's, they're using 1080p DLP engine, period. There are 2 million pixels there, not 8 million. But like what it says right here, it shifts each pixel diagonally by half a pixel. So yeah. if you can kind of picture this, I'm going to have to get real hand-wavy a little bit. We're sort of <laughs> taking a 1080p image and putting that on the screen, 
and then moving all two million pixels a half a pixel to the left and doing it again, and then move them all a half a pixel up and do it again, and then move them right and do it again. And now we've put eight million pixels on the, on the screen. If they can do that fast enough at 4x the video frame rate, then you kind of get four million pixels with maybe some weird they're laying on top of one another halfway issues. So no, this isn't pure, absolutely discrete 4K like you'd get from a flat panel yeah. or, or a DLP engine with 8 million pixel elements in it. Um, but it's kind of an interesting approach that maybe could work. I haven't seen one of these in person. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't see them at Etsy at, at all. I, um, I did go by the Epson booth, but I did not see this, this particular one. So... So basically, they're playing the hokey pokey with. Just like <laughs> and yeah. maybe it looks great. You know, maybe it looks awesome. Yeah. I haven't seen it, but um, you know, I think that's that's what's going to be the judge. You know, um, you know, how does it look? You know, does it does it start to give you a headache after you look at it for 20 minutes, or uh, is it the real deal? I'm you know, I'm not sure. It could it could be? It's definitely a creative approach, and uh, I applaud the uh, Epson guys for coming up with it. I'm just uh, trying to figure out if it's is it really 4K or is it a gimmick? I don't know. I suspect that this particular thing is a little bit of both. Yeah, I think I think Justin's right on that. I mean, you've got if you if they say they're showing you eight million pixels, maybe is, is how the is how they'll get get you in the details. Um, and my biggest problem with 4K right now, honestly, is is the differentiation between UHD TV and 4K, and the fact that it's already being a blurred line, and people are just throwing the stupid the same the same use using the same term. Both ways. So, can we well, talk about that? Sure. Because <laughs> I, I, he I've heard you say that before. I've heard other people say it before. I build big, big video switches and distribution systems. So, so my position is I don't care if it's 3840 wide or 4096 wide, whatever. I'll deal with it. I'll handle it. Why do you guys care so much about drawing that line above, right at 4,000? And this is above, and that's below. And screw you, that's not 4K. I mean, it's close enough, right? Uh, okay. So. Here, here I, I will give you my quick and dirty and snarky response and let these Perfect. two guys, because of stupid people. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not kidding, and it, I, I, I hate saying it that way, but it's the easiest and quickest way I've got, because of stupid people. You're going to have, you know, my yeah, guy down the street that says, come look at my 4K TV, and you're going to look and go, you know, has the little UHD TV sticker on it, and you're like, well, it's not exactly... So Tim, I can imagine you going over to your friend's house yes. and counting the vertical lines and I saying, "There's 3,840 of these, <laughs> jerk." <laughs> but I'm talking, but I'm not sure in the mass market that that's that important a distinction. It's, okay, so it's the same issue I have with with any dish or I'm sorry, any satellite or cable company saying they're delivering you 1080p. They're not. <laughs> okay, they're just flat out not. They're they're compressing the snot out of it and they're giving you. A, a compressed version of 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 HD, so that's I, I guess that's my biggest issue with it. Maybe there's an analogy we can draw to that that hard drive argument that went that went down a few years ago with it's a billion bytes. No, it's it's 1024 uh, times 1024 bytes or whatever yeah. it was. It was no, that's not a that's not a gigabyte. It's a 0.99 gigabytes, and we're gonna sue you. Maybe it's more <laughs> like that. That's how yeah, I'm gonna think about it. Okay, that, that'll, that'll work. work. No, but I mean, I think he's got a good point. I mean, for the mass market, you know, most people don't care. Like, in the well, consumer on, electronics... Think he's got a good point. What's yeah. that? Jeez. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, well, my first reaction was, where's Mark Coxon when you need it? Because he'll, 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 he'll go oh, all out on you on this. But, uh, <laughs> but, I mean, for, for most consumers out there, you put a 4K on, a, on, a, on the side of a box, and they're going to be happy with it. They won't care if it's, you know, 38 whatever by, you know, 2160 um, or 4,000 something or other by what other... What, whatever they you know they just know it's high res right it's 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 better than 1080p and they're happy yes. with it but th and that's probably true for most people buying these consumer displays but you know where where I I care about this in the medical world is that you know you you have to really manage the resolutions and you have to make sure you you are staying true to the native resolution and keeping keeping the signal unaltered throughout the signal path and um, that is important but you know I think. I think you're right because that's I'm um, I'm not certainly a representation of most people. You know, I'm I'm a very niche market doing medical integration, so it's important to me and a couple other um, mission critical applications where we do care about it. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the, yeah. In, in any high end you know commercial type AV environment, 
yeah, you need to think about that because, well, is it 4.1K or is it 3.8K? Uh, and then is what about that display? What about this other display? And do I want to stretch it? Do I want black bars? Or can I keep it native everywhere? These are all very important design questions. Yeah, I, I, I think the short answer to Justin's question, uh, why we care so much, is that we need something to argue about. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't have shows to do, huh, Jason? Yeah, it's a slow yeah. news cycle. What, what, you <laughs> All right, what do you guys um, think? We agree. All right, short show. All right. <laughs> uh, no, but I, you know, we've had this argument before on, on other shows, and I, I side with Justin. Like Coming from the residential side, to me, it's not that big of a deal. We're debating semantics here. Uh, I do think that there's some value in just calling it 4K and being done with it because it's something easy for consumers to latch onto and adopt, and then we can move forward with the, the process of, of implementing it. And it's our job as integrators to know the subtleties and when they matter and when they don't. I, I don't think we need to muddy the water with the average consumer uh, worrying about the distinctions between 4K and UHD. And uh, it just, I think it's going to be over their heads anyways, and I, and I don't really see the value in it. Uh, but I do think that it's, you know, it's worthwhile to debate these things because it, it just promotes more awareness uh, within our industry for people to really understand that there is a distinction there and uh, that distinction can be uh, critical like in a situation that Nate described um, depending on you know what facet of the audiovisual industry you work in um, so overall I think the debate is healthy but yeah does it really at the end of the day make a huge difference uh, in my world no it doesn't yeah. I think that's a good, that's a good way to end that one um, all right, one last one last story here, and we'll, we'll let you guys get out of here. Uh, from Electronic House, two things you can do now that the Nest works with Dropcam. Um, it's interesting <laughs> the fact that Dropcam was on this. Uh, first of all, there's two things that, that, that they mentioned. First of all, you can, um, according to the articles, carry scap kept is good lord. Is it time to go yet? <laughs> Capture scary events. And then they can talk to each other. So that's that, and that came under the heading of, of green AV, and, and that led me to a question. And Nate, we'll start with you. Is green AV still a thing? Uh, <laughs> and the reason I ask is this: is because there was a big push uh, late late 2000s, early you know 2010, 2011, uh, with a lot of with lead coming on board and, and this, that, and the other. Um, it was a push to differentiate. Um, AV that saved you money, that allowed you to turn things off and on, uh, that applied that you, you could apply to lead credits, and it seems, at least from my perspective, to be waning a little bit because so many things do that now, and so many manufacturers are being power conscious and uh, cons uh, conservative conscious. Um, is it still valuable to to differentiate you know, green AV from the rest of AV? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know if I have a, a very good answer for you about that one since uh, what I've been working in so far with the medical world has been uh, you know, not so much involved with the green AV versus, uh, I guess, inefficient AV. It's, it's kind of a very uh, specific thing. But um, I, I mean, I personally value it. I mean, if I have a system in my home that, you know, and I can hit a button and... You know, I know it's gonna it's gonna kill power to all the things that normally suck power, even when they're, you know, they're just idle. You know what I mean? It, it's not, you know, how much power does an amplifier draw when it's, you know, cranked up to ten and it's, you know, pumping out music versus when it's just on and just kind of, uh, you know, sitting in the background. Um, I, I definitely value that personally. I don't know if I, I've seen it really impact um, uh, much of much of the designs that I've had. Uh, so what you're saying is that medical people don't care about the environment. <laughs> you know, I was walking into a hospital the other day, and they said to use the rotating door, like the um, the turnstile door. Yeah. And they had a they had a, a sign in front of the like electronic door that would like open and shut. And they said, please uh, conserve energy and use the turnstile. And I'm thinking, how much energy does this hospital suck? You know, on a daily basis with all the gear being used, and then they, at the front door they're saying, save energy, <laughs> don't, don't use the electric door. I don't know, I guess a lot of people come in and out, but um, I don't know. I don't think it's a – I think green, green AV is a good thought. I don't know if it's practical in real life for a lot of situations unless you're doing the whole building. 
You know what I mean? If you're just picking off a room here, room there, eh, I don't know. I don't know how much value that's going to bring. But if you know somebody brings you in, or um, for example, I was talking to somebody the other day that is doing consulting out in Dubai, and he's working on like oh, wow. skyscrapers and stuff out there. So maybe for a consultant that's trying to, you know, give a client some good specifications for, you know, energy efficient uh, AV equipment. You know, this can be applied times, you know, 2,000, you know, across, you know, every floor of the skyscraper, yeah. you know, whatever, how many rooms they, they put in. Um, that, I think it, it does become a factor at a certain point, but it's, it's kind of knowing, knowing where that break point is, where it matters. Because okay. it's the important thing. All right. Uh, Jason, uh, Nate mentioned doing the entire building, and in your case, the entire house. Is it still a thing? Is it, are, are we still concerned about differentiating, you know, inefficient AV versus green AV? I have very few clients and architects who do request that, um, but usually it, it takes a back seat to, you know, the the way they want to experience and enjoy their home. Um, Nest is a perfect example. So you've got intelligence built into Nest where it, you know, it can, uh, there are certain areas where you can tie it into like your utility company. And basically you give your utility uh, kind of an, an ability to monitor it and maybe adjust temperature settings based on the energy demand. But, uh, you know, how far does that really go? Like, to what point is somebody going to sit in their home uh, and be really uncomfortable just to save a few dollars? Um, and that's my question, you know. And, and when it gets down to, like, the entertainment, the audiovisual components, uh, you know, we're not talking about a huge difference between uh, if you want to try to be green and, and select your components based on that versus if you just want to go out and select what you want based on how you want to enjoy your home. Uh, when you really run the numbers, uh, it doesn't make a huge difference. We are seeing out here in California more and more people are doing the solar thing. Obviously, yeah. that makes a lot of sense out here where it's always sunny. Uh, depends on where you live, really. I, I don't know. This this particular article that you sent was, like, I didn't really see the drop cam tie-in, which I think you were saying the same thing, like yeah. how this how this relates to it being more green. I guess maybe, you know, now that they're the same company, uh, Nest could possibly leverage some of the intelligence built into the drop cam camera to possibly improve like the location awareness within the house, maybe like automatically recognizing if people are there or away. Now instead of just using simple motion built into the thermostat, they can use uh, like facial detection, not necessarily recognition, but like detection to see if, if somebody's in the house. Um, you know, maybe there's a tie in there. I, I don't know. I, I don't think that for most consumers it, it's a driving issue uh, for them when they're making buying decisions about audiovisual, personally. Okay. All, right. All right, Mr. Kennington, you'll have the last word on this. Uh, green AV, is, this, is it still a thing that we're worried about? Uh, I think, you know, some of the cases mentioned, especially large new construction, big commercial buildings, All everybody wants their LEED certification, and that, that touches everything in the building, including... Uh, the AV. So certainly having the kinds of automation systems that can operate at that scale, that can tie into the building management systems. I mean, Nest is is obviously a, a great product for that small, you know, single residence uh, installation. But when we're talking, you know, large skyscrapers in Dubai, you know, there are entire software packages that 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 are the building management system. They control all the thermostats and all the HVAC and all the shades and all the lighting. And having those systems work together. Uh, can truly make a building more efficient. And just to bring it back to that personal level, I can say a place where, where green AV has affected my life. Um, I used to have a situation where my uh, entire AV system was a little bit cobbled together, uh, a little bit too power hungry, and left the electrical circuit just right on the edge of working, such that any time that I had a little space heater running and the home theater and I started up the microwave, bam, I lose everything. Wow. Yeah, so so finally, thanks to, uh, to to integrated by design Crestron products that I get for free, thank God, uh, I can bring those home, turn down the overall power consumption of the AV distribution system, uh, and now I'm happy to say that I can uh, cook in the microwave, enjoy a nice heated room, and enjoy AV technology all at the same time without tripping the 120-year-old uh, breakers in my uh, ancient Manhattan apartment. Wow. So you know, it, it still has a place, I think, in the real world. So, so is that is that one of the fringe benefits of, of working for, for the Big Blue Sestron? Fringe benefits? That's why I quit my last job and came here. Well, <laughs> Three years. So that, was, that was part of the deal, huh? Calls where it gets. He was like, all right, I'll come over for this and the, for DVPHD. That's right. That's right. Uh, 
All right, that's going to do it. Uh, that gentleman right there is Justin Kennington uh, from Crestron. Thank you, sir. Of course. Nice to be here. Where can uh, people find out more about you or about, uh, about Crestron? Uh, you can find us, of course, at Crestron.com. If you want to learn more about 4K, our views, our plans, and uh, what we think works and doesn't, Crestron.com slash 4K. All right, very good. Uh, that goes for 3840 as well. Oh, <laughs> yeah, why, you know what? Why didn't you call it 3840, huh? Why didn't you call I, it? You know, I am going to have UHD, a new web shortcut put up this afternoon. Count UHD on. certified. Yeah, uh huh. Mr. Not, yeah. Barnett, Crestron.com slash 3840 today. I'm on it. All right. Uh, Jason Griffin uh, from Bio, uh, Bio Home, rather, uh, but also from the, uh, the AV Shop Talk and a couple other podcasts. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a great conversation. I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, where can people find out more about you or the, the podcast or, or uh, by a home? Or Yeah, I think the uh, best place would just be on Twitter, at Jason Griffin. Um, and then Nate and I have our podcast at avshoptalk.com, which I think um, there's a ton of crossover. I think anyone who's interested in, in the shows and stuff that you're putting out will, would probably enjoy our show as well. So I would encourage sure. people uh, to stop by there, avshoptalk.com, and check out the podcast. Yeah, actually, one of the the newer shows, and, and the cool thing about me, and, and not cool thing about me, I should admit it. So, uh, <laughs> the cool thing about AV Nation, yeah, the cool thing about being me, the cool thing about AV Nation uh, is we. So I've been seriously, I've been mostly for my job, but from other stuff too. I seriously been traveling for the last month and a half, and we started a brand new show this Monday. I had nothing to do with this in any way, shape, or form. It came off without a hitch. It was beautiful. It was actually started. The, the genesis of it was was these two guys being on your guys' show, and that was uh, Mark Cox and, and Josh Schrago. Uh And it was a it was it was an AV cross talk, and it was a very good debate hosted by our buddy uh, uh, Brock McGinnis. So it was it, it, the cool thing about this place is that it'll go on, you know, even if I'm you know somewhere in the middle of nowhere. So absolutely. Uh, uh, all right, Mr. Nate Snyder, Big Nate, uh, eighty four, how to? Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. It was uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you, Tim. Uh, where can uh, people find out more about you or uh, about the podcast that you do, the the year to your YouTube channel? Yeah, I've been doing the YouTube thing since uh, 2011 as a YouTube partner. I put up videos when I can, just making how-to videos and uh, all kinds of fun stuff. So that's youtubecom slash bignate 84 and uh, on Twitter at bignate 84 how to and. Uh, I've been really enjoying the podcast, doing that with uh, with Jason. I think we're just starting to hit our stride, and you know we're trying to find our voice and figure out what type of show we, we want to produce. And we're having a lot of fun with it. We're meeting a lot of great people from uh, from the world of pro AV, and uh, uh, it's been it's been fun. So uh, hopefully uh, you've enjoyed some of the episodes there. I know we talked with uh, one of your uh, comrades over there, uh, Dave Silberstein. What episode was that, Jason? Oh yeah, I don't I don't remember offhand, but it was right right around the time of uh, Infocom, right before Infocom. Yeah. Well, Dave's a talker. Was it a long show? <laughs> we reined him in. <laughs> no, it was great. He was a great guest. Yeah, very good. And so so give me give me kind of the uh, if if you've never heard the uh, the AV shop talk, what um, what what will they expect? Do you want to take it, Jason, or you want me to do oh, it? Go ahead. Go ahead, Nate. Yeah, so, I mean, what we try to do is sit down and, and have a chat with uh, someone from the world of, of, of pro AV, right? So that could be a manufacturer. It could be an integrator. It could be someone from the world of broadcast. Uh, we've been working with somebody trying to line up a, an interesting interview from somebody who works uh, on the broadcast side of things. But um, basically, we want to hear people's story, how they career career story, how they got into into the world of pro AV, maybe what their first job was, and uh, you know what what they got going on, and uh, you know if they work for a manufacturer, we talk to we. It's been easy to get marketing people. A lot of a lot of oh, marketing yeah. people want to get on the show and, and, and talk, but uh, so we're trying to navigate a good balance of of, of trying to find interesting guests. But uh, basically, the tagline is um, you know covering the latest trends in uh, audio, the world of audio video and emerging technologies. So. Um, that's 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 pretty much it, and um, you know, we we try to keep it to about a half hour or so. And um, let's see, just recorded. Uh, this is an interesting one. Just recorded an interview with uh, Gerald Stevens, and he started a Facebook group called uh, uh, AV Install Nightmares. I don't know if you participate oh, in this. Nice. 
<laughs> if you don't participate, if you if you work in pro AV and you don't participate in this group, you're you're missing out because it's just a place where people can come vent and just take a little snapshot of the mess that they're walking into and. Um, it, it's it's got over nine thousand members. Holy cow! It's got and they're active members too. It's not like one of those LinkedIn groups with thirty thousand members and mm -hmm. nobody actually does anything. But these people, like I, I posted a question the other day. Uh, I think about HD based T extenders, and uh, you know, within ten minutes, I had probably six or seven responses. So it, that's that's the cool thing I like about it. So anyway, we interviewed Gerald Stevens about why he started this group and in this community and. Uh, uh, he's a, he's a very interesting guy, so that episode should be posted sometime in October. Very cool. All right. Well, uh, check them check them out if you would please. Uh, also, go by our website, uh, avnation.tv. Avnation.tv. As I mentioned, uh, we just started a brand new show uh, with uh, Josh Drago and Mark Coxon uh, as they debate different uh, items. Uh, the first one was IT versus AV. Uh, it was uh, moderated by by Brock McGinnis. Good good show. Uh, and like I said, I had nothing to do with it, and it was freaking fabulous. It was it was <laughs> so cool for me personally on on uh, so many different levels that that yeah, it, it was just very very cool. Um, just to be able to sit back and watch it and and, and watch everybody, George uh, Tucker and, and and Chris Nano and everybody else that kind of helped out with it. It was very cool just for me personally to sit back and watch it. Uh, and the content itself was, was very good. So yeah. Now, is that going to be Josh and Mark each time debating a new thing, or is it going to be different people? <sighs> well, here's the thing, right? Um, my original understanding, and again, I, I read the emails as I kind of go back and forth. That was my original understanding. <laughs> However, uh, between Chuck uh, from SCN and uh, and uh, our buddy, um, oh, why did his name just go in my head? From Shin. Um, Leonard Suskin. Uh, started going back and forth about the, about the AV selfie and debating that, and George piped up and said, "Hey, you want to do this on the on the debate show we've got now?" So yeah, you know who knows? Who knows? You know, if, 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 you know, it's kind of like uh, you know, kind of like people's court. You know, if you can't settle this, just amicably, we'll we'll throw you in a room together and and uh, and have somebody moderate the debate. So who knows? Uh, but yeah, my, my understanding was originally it was just going to be Josh and and uh, and and Mark, but who knows? Yeah. It could be anything, you know. It could eventually be me and I, Silly, debating 4K, so <laughs> or 8K at that point. Um, so yeah, go by the website avnation.tv. Uh, apparently, we have some new blogs coming down the pipe uh, from our friend Victoria and uh, and Tony Zadi. Uh, so check those out if you would please. All sorts of really cool things. Most of them I have nothing to do with, which I'm very very pleased about. So. Uh, this show I still love doing, so we'll, we'll keep going, cranking it out. We've got a new ed tech coming down the line in State of Control and some other shows as well. So check it out, avnation.tv, avnation.tv. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. This has been AV Week.